Do you remember <clears throat> in politics such uncertain times as we have now? It seems to me in the run up to this election, nothing is cast in no, stone. No, I, I, I agree with that. And that's the direct product of the dead heat at the 2010 election. I hadn't lived through a dead heat like that. There was one when I was about nine months old uh, in 1940 when uh, the Labor Party and the UAP and the Country Party had an equal number of seats and a couple of independents. But the dead heat uh, in the 2010 election is, is the major cause of this uncertainty because the government doesn't have a clear mandate or any clear air. And the opposition doesn't believe that it's been chastised by the electorate and has therefore mm. gone away and, and, and rethought everything as opposition. So no one's a winner, no one's a loser. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and you can understand the the psychology of both sides, and you know, to be fair to both of them, uh, you can understand that. Uh, the government doesn't have clear air, particularly the Prime Minister, and the opposition thinks, gee, uh, this mob are on the verge of falling over and we'll keep the pressure on. And that's very understandable. And you produce this you know, policy paralysis, but it'll change after the next election. Whoever wins will win clearly, in my opinion. Well, there are European countries where the dead heat prevails. It's become yeah. part of the culture. Yeah, but Why that has that not happen been here? the culture in this country. And, and part of it, of course, has been due to the fact that we've maintained single-member constituencies, uh, whereas many European countries, for their lower houses, they have some kind of proportional representation, so you always get closer results. We're a long way out from the election, but mm. Rudd is probably going to move, isn't he? He's looking like it. What does your nose tell you? Oh, yeah, I don't think he's ever given up the idea of coming back, and that's human nature and understandable. Uh, I think uh, there's a real possibility they'll bring him back. In the end, uh, leadership is determined by the laws of arithmetic, uh, and uh, even the most popular leaders can be removed if people think they're going to do better under another one. I and mean, the well, laws of arithmetic say that Gillard can't win, but Rudd can. Well, that is the indication of some of the polls, although once uh, he were back in the job, if that was their intention, then uh, he'd be revisited with the policy failures uh, for which he is responsible, like the chaos of border protection and, and, and the wasteful expenditure on the uh, pink bats and school halls and so forth. I mean, they all happened under his regime, not under Gillard. So There's a chance that the Australian people feel he didn't get a fair go, though, and they might feel sorry for him. Uh, there are some people who do feel that, that the Labor Party, particularly Labor Party supporters. There are, I've, I've met many Labor Party people who just can't work out uh, why their party should have got rid of somebody who won an election. Now, if Rudd seizes leadership mm. and maintains his public popularity in the polls re leading to an election, does that put pressure on Tony Abbott because his popularity is not good? Does that put pressure on his job? Well, there are a lot of um, suppositions. So nothing set in stone, uh, uh, as we uh, say. No, 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 hang on. No, no, no. I'm not, I didn't say that. I, I don't believe for a moment that uh, the Liberal Party will be led at the next election by any, anybody other than Tony Abbott. Not Malcolm Turnbull? No, I, no, I don't believe so. And, you know, I, Malcolm's a, a great bloke and I like him a lot. But Tony Abbott has given, through his leadership, the Liberal Party a position that they never dreamt they would have three or four years ago. And his, his uh, feat in bringing them to a dead heat at the last election was extraordinary. And uh, he's moving into a different phase. He's now accepting that he's got to... Uh, lead an alternative government and not just an opposition and I think the public will respond to that now and he understands it he's he's very astute uh, he knew that there had to be a very negative oppositional phase uh, and whilst he'll keep uh, being a strong opposition leader he is now in the phase of presenting himself as an alternative prime minister just before I talk more about Tony can we uh, just discuss Malcolm for a moment? Sure. I mean, at least it is most fortunate for the Liberal Party to have someone of his calibre in reserve, isn't it? Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I think I had quite a bit to do with persuading Malcolm to stay in Parliament after he had announced that he was going to leave. Tell me the story. Well, he rang me up the day afterwards and said, John, um, can I come and see you? And he came to see me and he said, I think I've made the wrong decision. And I said, I think you have too. And uh, if you want my advice, I'd just announce that I'm going to change my mind. You'll, <laughs> you'll get 48 hours of ridicule, but then after that, everybody will have forgotten it. And that is exactly what happened. And people had a go at him, you, know, you don't know what you're doing, etc., etc. But most people are very pleased that he stayed. I'm happy. I think Malcolm's very bright. 
uh, and uh, I think he's got a huge contribution to make. Uh, I think Tony Abbott's leadership skills were superior and Tony was able to hold the party together and put them in a position uh, of opposition to Rudd's climate change policies which really panicked Rudd and Rudd changing his position on climate change was the beginning of his decline in the polls which led to the party panicking and getting rid of him. So it doesn't matter if you're a great businessman and you can run a corporation, that's not the same is it? I mean I remember when people, it, in, in your years, people talked about parachuting John Elliott in because mm. he can run a company, he could, could run the country. Mm. It's not so, is it? Well, nothing automatically you know, translates. That doesn't mean to say um, a businessman, skilled businessman or woman can't at some time be uh, a prime minister, but it doesn't automatically translate. I've always thought that politicians should know how business works and businessmen should know how politics work, but they shouldn't automatically assume there can be an easy swap. It, it never works quite as easily, but Malcolm is one of those people who has a great capacity to learn on the job, and uh, he, he, he likes politics. And you learn from blows oh, and rejections. Oh, well, I mean, I made plenty of mistakes, and you, you always do. Um, there's, there's never been a successful leader in the history of the world that hasn't made a lot of mistakes. The important thing is to get the big issues right. When you look at a career of people like, somebody like Winston Churchill, he made an enormous number of mistakes, but... Mm -hmm. Starting with Gallipoli. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a gold standard, didn't want to give India independence, uh, but I tell you what, he got, he got the biggest issue of the 20th century right, and that is... Uh, the failure of the democracies to resist uh, mm. uh, Nazism and fascism and, uh, and the leadership he gave of the free world at a critical hour made him the greatest figure of the last 100 years. Which was, in a way, a template that guided you uh, later in your own Well, I mean, I, 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 mm. he's, he's an inspirational character to me. Is Tony Abbott really the love child of Bronwyn Bishop and John Howard? <laughs> that's, that's his florid rhetoric. Um, he has a close association with both of us, and uh, I, I'm an undisguised supporter of Tony's. I think he's got enormous ability. There was no better red person in my cabinet uh, than Tony Abbott. He's got a great understanding, and he's a very good listener. Tony, will, we, will we come to know him and like him more? I'm, I'm he's not sure, popular. I, I, can, I, you, I, can you understand his unpopularity with women, for instance? No, well, I think that's, that's unjustified and a result of an effective government campaign and he is reacting to that. And, uh, but the best way to react to those sorts of things is, is to put on display the plans you have for the future of the country. And he's beginning to do that. And once that occurs, uh, a lot of those reservations, uh, even if people don't entirely abandon them, they will say, well, that's irrelevant. I like what he intends if he gets into government to do. He said strange things. I mean, what did you think when he said that a woman's greatest gift is her virginity? Well, look... You've, it you've, sounds you've, like you've, some kind of 15th no, 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 century look, right, religious look, look, fanaticism. Everybody has a different way of expressing um, a, a... You wouldn't have a, said a, that. Well, well I'm, I'm, I wouldn't have been uh, interviewed by a, a magazine into that sort of area, but what he was saying in his own language was uh, a natural parental concern that uh, their children uh, live responsible lives and don't get into situations that they will later regret. Now, there's not a father in Australia who wouldn't feel protective towards his daughters. Uh, we, would all, we would express it differently. Mm. We'd all express it in our own way, but uh, as the father of a daughter, I was always protective towards my daughter, and I still am. I mean, that's human nature, and that's what Tony was expressing. And although he's I'm sure your daughter wouldn't thank you for that no, kind well, of expression, I, though. Uh, well, uh, but <laughs> I, I haven't used that expression. <laughs> no, I know uh, you wouldn't. But, and the point I'm making is that that was Tony's way uh, of, of, of expressing a, a concern and a, and, and a sense of protectiveness. And I think there are probably a lot more people out there than you imagine who, while they may not have said that, uh, they understood what he was getting at and would support the sentiment behind it. Let's forget about the popularity, the personal popularity of the leaders. If you look at the two-party preferred mm. polling, uh, Labor is in for a trouncing and the Liberals will win a big victory. The question is how big? How many seats do you think? Oh, Tony I'm going to get into that, Charles. I get silly. No, because it, 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 it will wrongly be seen as counting 
the chickens, the Liberal chickens, before they hatch. It's important because if that doesn't happen, then you get back to your warning about a hung parliament and we'll go through the whole thing you again know, in a year's you, time. You only need a majority of a few seats to be able to govern. I mean, Menzies had a majority mm. of one, uh, but his parliament in 1961 with the majority of one, they were all Liberals, all Liberals and country party. Um, I clearly believe on the basis of the current polls that Abbott will win comfortably, but uh, just how many, I'm not going to try that game. Some independents deserve to get back? Well, I don't think either of the uh, independents who support the government deserve to get back, or well, there's three of them. Well, Andrew Wilkin, I'm not sure where he stands, but uh, I, I, I hope both Oakeshott and Windsor lose their seats because the political predisposition of those two electorates was uh, uh, not to support the current government, but rather to support the opposition. And uh, they didn't take any notice of that. And uh, I'd like to see both of those seats come back to the National Party. Independents do make for interesting political times, though, don't they? Oh, there's no doubt about that. If, if, if you are only interested in the theatre and the drama and the day-to-day -day tension of politics, you'd have a hung parliament every day. But if you are interested in long-term... You're reading my mind. <laughs> <laughs> ..policy, and I understand you know, the Canberra Gallery loving the current situation, but when you have a clear result, what happens is the government's got mandate-free here. The opposition says, well, look, we've lost, and we're now going to go and work out why and what will make us more attractive. Let's talk about border security. Now, sure. Tony Abbott says, we'll turn back the boats. Now, it's a catchy slogan, mm. but is that all it is? Can you really turn back the boats? Well, we'll find out when we get a government uh, under Tony Abbott that, that we'll try and do that. Well, you were such a government. Did you ever order a boat to be turned around? Oh, yes, we did in 2001. Some boats were towed back uh, to the uh, edge of the territorial waters of Indonesia and they sailed in and they were taken by the Indonesian. Look, the undeniable fact is we stopped the boats coming in 2001. We went from having you know, two or 3,000 people arrive or some thousands arrive in 2001 to a total of two people arriving in 2002. We stopped the boats and the Rudd government, and Mr Rudd in particular, unwound a, a completely successful policy and has now given us chaos. It's a hard thing as a Prime Minister to order an Australian naval officer mm. to step onto a boat which is full of human beings, mm. men, women and children who come from greatly distressed places, and you know because mm. you've been to these places, and to tell them we're turning around and sending Yes, that is them. hard. That's hard for, mm. for a serving officer. Uh, look, uh, I, I, the people who order that are back in Canberra. Yeah, yeah I, I accept all that. But that, that is always the case when, when governments ask uh, their military personnel to do difficult, mm. dangerous, uh, sometimes life-taking things. I, I understand that very clearly. Sometimes inhumane things. Uh, yes. I don't think our people ever behaved inhumanely. I'm sure they didn't. I never saw any evidence that they behaved inhumanely. They behaved very carefully and very bravely. But it, you say it's a hard thing to do that. Mm. It's also a hard thing to say to somebody who's been waiting 10 years or something in a refugee sure, camp sure. and who's been told they're a legitimate refugee Gee, but there's no place in Australia for you because that place has been taken by somebody who jumped the queue. Well, the Labor Party's pretty much come round to your Pacific solution mm. again, haven't mm. they? So why isn't it working now? Well, because once you let the genie out of the bottle, to use that old expression, it's extremely hard to put it back, particularly uh, when uh, all of the things that kept it in the bottle in the first place have not been embraced by the current government. They haven't embraced temporary protection visas. So it'll they, be harder for Tony to... It, it will be hard, of course, because we, have, we will have had several years of, of, of porous borders. Of course it will be hard, but uh, he will have the will to try and he will have, in the eyes of the Indonesians, in particular, the track record of belonging to a government that successfully protected our borders, namely my government. Do you think the uh, people smugglers and indeed their customers think that turn back the boats is now all bluff and bluster? No, I don't think they are. I don't think they do. I, 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 don't, I don't accept that. No, I don't. Of course, the marvellous thing to do would be uh, to sort out the situations in these most unfortunate countries so people didn't feel they had to leave. Well, of course, uh, but that is like saying the, you know, the, the, the answer to, to uh, the health bill is uh, 
uh, to make sure that people never embrace bad habits like right, or smoking or over drinking or just starvation or that everyone gets yeah, fed. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so these people will always be with us. Climate change might even make it worse. Look, I, I think there will always be a refugee problem around the world and every country has got to play a part, but we rate very well in the size of our humanitarian refugee program. And the critical thing, Charles, is to maintain public support for orthodox immigration and a humanitarian refugee program. And the way to do that is to, is to assure the Australian people that a government is serious about uh, making sure that the people who do come to this country make a contribution to Australia and they're also uh, chosen according to a proper criteria of refugee entitlement. Now, we used to have that, and when we had it a few years ago, public support for immigration rose very significantly. Now we don't have it, and public support for immigration is declining, and that's a bad thing. Can we talk about the vindictiveness in Parliament? Mm. Because you were always a gentleman in political debate. Is it because things have been so close and there are no clear winner and no clear loser, as you were saying earlier? I, I, think, I think that is a significant part of it. There is a, a level of day-to-day -day tension and uh, a feeling that what is here today mightn't be here tomorrow about Australian politics that I did never experienced... Uh, before I entered Parliament when Gough Whitlam was Prime Minister. Now, OK, we, 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 we attacked him and we criticised his government and everything, and he had a, a lot of problems in his last year, but he still had a clear majority. And uh, until the drama of the dismissal, there was never a feeling that the government was going to fall tomorrow. And mm. then you had the Fraser government, the Hawke government, Keating government, and then my government. At no stage did people feel that everything was going to change tomorrow, but we've really lived under the... the, the, the the shadow of, of government fragility uh, since the 2010 election, I think that's added to the intensity uh, of the political debate. And does the temper and the ferocity in Parliament and the attacks on the female Prime Minister, even albeit political attacks, has it fed a disrespect for the office outside when a radio announcer can start talking about putting a Prime Minister in a chaff bag and dumping them at sea? Well, the I don't, office is I mean, I think Prime ministers have always been attacked, and nobody ever talked about dumping you and at sea. Oh, in a oh I, I can't. Look, I'm, I, you know, I'm not. I'm not asking for any sympathy, <laughs> but I can recall a few. Don't you think things. it's rougher now? Uh, look, um, I think the intensity of the language, but it's been on both sides. I mean, the things that have been said about Tony Abbott and the, you know, the the remarks have been that have been made. Frankly, his attitude to women. I mean, this argument that he's got a problem with women is complete nonsense. A lot of women polled seem to think that he has a well, problem. Well, if, if, if you keep saying something like that sure. from one side of politics, some people will believe it. What does Jeanette think? Um, well, if you want to get Jeanette's opinion, you ask her. I'm too scared. No, that's right. No, I respect my wife too much to ever presume to answer on her behalf. Is Bob Hawke right, though, when he said that the best thing that the Labor Party has going for it is... It's a bit of a backhander to the Prime Minister. The best thing the Labor Party has going for it is Tony Abbott. No, I think, I mean, I think Bob... I, I often agree with Bob, and uh, uh, I don't mind Bob's company at all, but on this issue, he's completely wrong. I mean, he, uh, he said before the last 2010 election that Tony Abbott had no hope. And, you know, he almost pulled off something nobody has pulled off since uh, the Great Depression when the Scullin government became the only government in Australian history to boot, be booted out after one term. And, of course, you said of uh, Tony that the greatest thing you can do as a leader of the opposition is to get a Prime Minister's scalp. Well, he, he got uh, Kevin Rudd's scalp. Mm. I mean, the, it has to be understood that the, the real story... It's a pretty visceral business, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, the, the real story of the last three years... Is, is, is that if anybody other than Tony Abbott had been leading the Liberal Party, uh, Kevin Rudd would have remained leader of the Labor Party and would have won the last election, mm -hmm. in my opinion, with a comfortable majority. Uh, that, in my opinion, is why uh, Abbott's position is so strong. Tony Abbott wouldn't want Kevin Rudd back. He'd rather face the current prime minister. Well, that's asking me to do something I used put to, I declined to do when I was prime minister, and that is engage in political commentary. Uh, however, I knew uh, you'd say yeah. that eventually. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> but if were you prime minister, you would rather face Gillard than Rudd. 
I mean, well, it's axiomatic. Uh, well, uh, she's struggling in the polls, um, uh, and they indicate that um, uh, he might be doing better. But once he were brought back, if that was the will of the La Labor Party, I'm not certain that uh, uh, things mightn't go back to him because... There are a lot of nasty things said about him by people like Wayne Swan and Nicola Roxon. But as you said to Malcolm, look, you can say, I made a mistake. Yeah. And in 48 hours, it's all over. What mm. does Rudd have to say? I can hear him now. He'll ask his own questions. Have I learned from my previous experience? <laughs> yes, I mm. have. Mm. Will I be kinder to my colleagues? Mm. Yes. Will I think about my colleagues, although I'm driven by my urgent need to fix Australia? Mm. That's what he'll say, won't look, look, Charles... Um, Let's let's let, let's sort of you know cut this down to its essence. We, you're asking me, do I think the Labor Party might bring back Rudd? I think they could, if the polls continue to be very bad, then whatever people feel about an individual, they they can panic and make a change. Um, will he be a tougher opponent? Uh, you won't really know that unless and until he comes back. But the Labor brand, irrespective of who leads the Labor Party now, is so bad. I mean, bringing Kevin Rudd back won't remove Mr McDonald and Mr Obeid. Uh, it, won't, it won't remove Mr Craig Thompson. Uh, it won't remove the failure of the border protection policy. It won't remove the waste of pink bats and things like that. So, Can I talk about workplace reform? Sure. Can I use the term work choices? Yeah, you can use any term you like. So it's not anathema? It's not dead? You don't want to no, see that. No, you know, that, is, that is a tricky question. Uh, look, look, work choices, as I have acknowledged, had, had one um, political error, and, and that was the uh, removal of the no disadvantage test and its replacement by uh, a less um, rigid, nonetheless quite good test. Now, that was a mistake. We acknowledged that. We actually changed it before we lost office. But uh, all the other things we did in industrial relations... Uh, uh, I, I would continue to defend, but that's the past. What Tony Abbott decides to do is a matter for him. But f speaking for myself, uh, I'm very proud of what we did in the area of industrial relations, very proud. It's pretty obvious to anyone who looks into it that we do need workplace mm. reform. Mm. But to use that old phrase, the mob don't like it, do they? The mob liked it quite a lot until... It played a role in our defeat in 2007, but it wasn't the major reason we lost in 2007. We lost in 2007 because of the its time factor. In the modern world, um, the shelf life of a government is uh, not much beyond 10 years unless the opposition is absolutely hopeless. A shifting demographic, a change in the workplace that has taken place is the fact that an awful lot of people who were once employees are now private contractors. Mm. So a lot of people who are still working class people are actually small business people, mm. a bit like your dad. Mm. Well, I, I recognised this um, um, a long time ago, that the entrepreneurial aspirational spirit of people who often had labour backgrounds, as you say, uh, it was there. And, and you need an industrial relations system that accommodates. Do you think labour think... appreciates that shift? No, I don't think the Labor Party does appreciate it because the Labor Party now is more heavily, uh, uh, more extensively run rather by people who've been trade union officials than they were even in Bob Hawke's time. He may have been the president of the ACTU, but a lot of people around him weren't as uh, wedded to the union way of doing things as, uh, as the present government seems to me to be far more wedded at a time when there are fewer people who belong to unions. Uh, but how we respond to that is, of course, uh, a matter for the current opposition. Uh, I'm happy to talk about what we did and defend it because I'm very proud of what we did in that area. The changes suggest that there needs to be more of a scramble between the two parties, not a party for big business and not a party for trade unions and blue-collar workers, but a selection and a chase for the middle ground, right? Well, the party that, that, that I led for 16 years was not a party for big business. It was sensitive to big corporations. But uh, if, if there were a, a wellspring of the Liberal Party that I know best, it's the small business wellspring. Uh, the, the idea that you start with nothing. It's where you came from. Yeah, of course it's where I came from and I believed in it. And uh, you are always better in public life when you are promoting things that you feel and believe in. 
So while unfair dismissal laws might strike a chord at one level to those people who think maybe I could be unfairly dismissed, mm -hmm. To a small business that's struggling on is by no means rich, those kind of punitive fines could destroy them, couldn't it? Oh yes, there's a big difference. If, you've, if you're running a, a little business and got four or five people in it, and one of them is being uh, you know, extremely difficult and disruptive, then you have to be able to let that person go and you shouldn't have to say, pay a penalty of forty or fifty thousand dollars go away money in order to bring that about. I mean, anybody who's had any understanding of how to run a small business will know that. But on the other hand, if it's a very large corporation, you can manage and absorb and accommodate those things a lot more readily. That's why you need uh, more flexibility in areas like this. Can I talk about our place in the world? Mm. We owe our present prosperity to China, and historically we owe our national security to the United States of America. These are two rivals. Where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with um, uh, the overriding goal uh, of, of, of never feeling that we have to make a choice between the two of them. Uh, the, the idea is now promoted that such is the rivalry that we've got to make a choice. That would be foolish in the extreme. Didn't Julie Gillard make a choice when she stationed American troops on Australian no, soil? No, I think that was, I agreed with that. I agreed with Gillard's position on stationing the American. You didn't do it though. Uh, well, we, we did a lot of other things to demonstrate our commitment to the American alliance. I don't think we could be accused of, of being uh, laggardly on that. Uh, but th the point I make is that America and China are for different reasons very important to our future, critical. Uh, America is our closest ally, we have common values. And if there ever were uh, a knockdown, drag out fight between China and the United States, I've no doubt that we'd support the United States. But, 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 uh, our aim should it's always a be. Point. <laughs> our aim should always be uh, to stop that happening. And and, and what chances are of that happening? I'll be pardon? What chances? No, I, are I that think happening? I think the chances of it happening are quite remote. I mean, China at the moment has got too many internal problems to be the aggressor that many people believe she could become. She got demography, ageing population, and one child policy, and the other the other problem is uh, the rumblings of democratic discontent. Uh, the current generation, which is the first enriched in many cases, yeah. will put up with An educated being... middle class won't take it, will they? No, the next generation take yeah. prosperity for granted. That, that's the point, John, is that there are so many elephants in the Sino-Australian yeah, sitting room. Yeah. Uh, there's the fact that this is actually a, a communist totalitarian dictatorship. Mm -hmm. There are, there are human, human rights issues. And then there is Tibet, mm -hmm. which we don't mention, do we? No, what, what we Do you mention to, it when you go to China? I don't think I mentioned um, uh, Tibet. I certainly didn't mention it regularly, no. Uh, but, but then I didn't expect... Um, uh, well, we're trying to sell coal to them. Uh, yeah, of course we're trying to have it. We've got to be common sense. And the, the answer on this uh, is not to lecture China, but when China tr treads on our toes and tries to get us to abandon our values and practices, we resist them. And they, on a couple of occasions, they tried that with me. Uh, that when, when there was a, a, a defector in the consulate in Sydney, they said, send him back. And I said, no, we're going to follow the Australian rules. And the Australian rules were followed, and he was given political asylum. Well, despite all the warnings from the Chinese that that would blow up our relationship, nothing happened. We went back to business as usual. Now, that is the way to deal with a country like China. You defend your own values when China confronts them, but you don't go out of your way to lecture and sermonise to a country that is important to us economically. Now, call that pragmatism. Uh, I call it pragmatism. Yeah, well, but I, but I think it's um, you know, pragmatism in the national interest, which is something that prime ministers should always seek to practice. How do we encourage democracy within China without offending the Chinese? Well, there are natural forces at work encouraging democracy. Um, mass communications, mm. uh, uh, the social media, uh, the IT revolution, all of those things uh, mean, um, mean that the capacity of the Chinese regime to contain uh, this, the, the rumblings of democracy get weaker and weaker each year.